people who don't even expect such things to happen, they do get it. And to actually mention it, and to mention the dangers of it, and the way to sustain it is really helpful, simply because it's possible. And a simile which I use, which emphasizes the fact that it's possible, and inspires you that yes, you can do it. Uh oh, something's not working. Okay. Okay, I'm not focused enough. <laughs> You're distracted by the corners, but... Yeah, no, the, the machine is. <laughs> so, to make it nice and uh, easy for you to understand how it works and how it's possible and how these things can happen, whether you like it or not. It was a simile of the thousand petal lotus. And that thousand petal lotus simile is not really part of Theravada, so some people say. It's more like Vajrayana. But I don't care what part of Buddhism it's from. If it works and it's good and it's true, then it's helpful, then why not? And in fact, sometimes people ask me what type of Buddhism I teach. And for those who haven't heard this before, I always want to be eclectic. So I try to make a combination of the three major Buddhist traditions of Hinayana, Mahayana, and Vajrayana. And how I put those all together, have the H from Hinayana, the Aha from Mahayana, and the Yana from Vajrayana. And what does that spell? Mahayana. Hahayana. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> lost, it, lost it already. <laughs> so I practice Hahayana Buddhism. <laughs> That's what I thought when people crack up like that. Gives me meaning to my life. <laughs> and so if you get a decent teaching from anywhere, then follow it. That's another thing which I love to impress on you. That if you find as a teacher coming in, he's got a good reputation or she's got a good reputation, go and listen to them. You always find something in their teaching which is helpful. The rest of it, which you don't agree with, then fine, and don't have to follow that. But always some little bits which are, are beautiful, then please follow it. Even in that, I would call him a scaddywag teacher because I think it's valid, that monk Chogyam Trungpa. You know, he first came over to UK in Scotland in Sami Ling Monastery. But then he turned out to be a very bit of, bit of a scallywag. But nevertheless, in one of his books, you know, he wrote this beautiful essay on spiritual materialism. And if you haven't read that, it's well worth a read. He noticed that when, especially Buddhism, went to the US, now, the U.S. is a very materialistic culture. I mean, that's just a generalization. There's many beautiful people from the U.S. But the materialistic culture over there, he noticed that many of the religious traditions and leaders were also following that type of tradition. Who's the wealthiest? Who's got the biggest monasteries? Who's got the fanciest robes? Who's got the most Rolls Royce cars? If you remember that. And sometimes that was something which really turned people off quite legitimately. It's one of the reasons why it made it difficult to raise funds for decent projects. You all know that any funds which I raise or help raise for Anu Kampa, how, how much of a share do I get? Do I get 10% of anything I write? You just get our volunteers to make you Connor's milk. <laughs> yeah, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that as the monks, the nuns, we don't get anything out of this personally. We just try and make sure that it's a place where you can have to practice, to go, to be inspired. And it's a beautiful thing to do. It's one of the things I learned, that monks and nuns practice generosity as well, big time. And we practice generosity, not what we can get for ourselves, but what we can give to others. We teach by example there. I don't have any money to give to others, but I have my time, any wisdom, any kindness, any support, and to give that to others. And that's a beautiful thing to be able to do. So, uh, oh, is somebody coming in the door here? More people coming in? Is somebody at the door? 
Okay, yeah. Oh, they're running in. It's okay. It's a shame they can't come in this way. Comes in. Anyway, rules and regulations. Anyway. Someone's there, Adrian. Okay, good. Me worry. <laughs> Chill out, Adrian. <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> okay, how to chill out. <laughs> so the simile I wanted to, to mention, get to, because I usually leave it to the very end, the thousand petal lotus simile. That many of you may remember Om Mani Padme Hum. Many people know that simile or know that phrase, but no, many people know what it means. And so my interpretation of what it means is like a worship, a reverence to the jewel in the heart of the lotus. Padme is in the lotus. The mani is a jewel. And so who is the lotus? Each one of you is a lotus. And inside of you, deep inside, each one of you have got this magnificent jewel right inside. And so that is like a worship, a praise to that amazing jewel in each one of you. No one is without it. But the problem is, it's hidden so deeply that sometimes it's difficult to reach it. So how do you reach the jewel in the heart of the lotus? So first of all, you're aware of your lotus. If you've ever seen a lotus in the botanical gardens, have any lotuses in the botanical gardens? Anyone know? Anyone go there? Anyway, it's a bit of a cold climate in Sheffield for lotuses. But nevertheless, there may be one somewhere, or you may have seen one if you ever go to Asia. And you see a lotus at night time is all closed up. And if you look on the outside of that lotus, it hasn't got much colour to it. It's quite bland. If you go close to it and sniff it, it's got no scent and it's got no... It's very unlikely that inside that flower, all closed up, there can be anything beautiful or fragrant or precious. But then what happens in the morning? This even happens in Sheffield, you know. The sun comes up. <laughs> It did come up this morning, I could see it. <laughs> Sorry. You know, I, I was born in London. And in London, we, even though my mother was living in this council flat, 17 stories up, had this beautiful view over long distance, but nevertheless, you could never see the sunrise or the sunset. Never. It would always set behind the clouds, the smog or the fog. And even those days, London was a very dirty city. And I always remember as a kid walking along the River Thames and there were signs everywhere. If anybody falls in, please go to the hospital straight away. <laughs> get, honestly, get your stomach pumped out because the water inside the Thames was just so toxic. And you know how they solved that problem? It's a wonderful environmental story which was done such a long time ago, which was beautiful, simple. They made a simple law that any factory uh, which uh, used the water from the River Thames, they had to have the inlet pipe where they took water from the Thames downstream of their outlet pipe. So whatever water, the dirty water they put back in the Thames, they had to be the first, peop first people to suck it back in again. And it's a simple law, but brilliant. And because of that, that actually cleaned up the Thames. until so there's now fish in the Thames. And if you fall in, you don't have to have your stomach pumped out. I kind of like those laws. There was a law in Thailand uh, in Ubon, where I uh, was a monk for many years. There was very few toilets for the taxi drivers, and they were very poor. So they always had to go to this wall in, uh, in uh, Ubon, where they would have a pee. And nothing could stop them, even though they had signs on there, say, you'll be fine. They would still urinate on the wall until some very smart fellow in the council there, just put up a sign. 
Ati Pesawama, which means in Thai, this is where dogs can urinate. <laughs> and, so, and so every time they wanted to go for, you, for a pee, they, they, they saw that this was allowed if they were a dog. And they actually stopped it very quickly. I kind of like that sort of, yeah, it's not nice to call anybody a dog, but nevertheless, it stopped the environmental problem. Anyway, back to the lotus. <laughs> So on the outside of a lotus, if you have a careful look, the outermost petals are quite coarse. They're like corrugated and they are never very clean because it's the outermost petals have to protect whatever's inside from the wind, from the dust, from the storms and any people as well. That's why it's quite tough to protect the petals inside. But then, in the morning, where, except in London, when the sun rises <laughs> and starts to warm the outermost petal of the lotus, then what happens? The outermost petal starts to open. It opens because of the light and the warmth of the sun in the early morning. And when it fully opens, you get the next layer of petals inside the outermost one. And the next layer of petals has got some color, some fragrance even. It starts to look like a flower rather than some protective sheath. And that allows that layer of petals to receive the warmth and the light of the sun. So that starts to open up. When that opens up, that allows the next layer of petals to open up. They open up one after the other. When the previous layer of petals has opened up, the next layer of petals can receive light and warmth of the sun and they too can slowly open up. That's how a lotus opens up, naturally. Not through force, but just through the combination of light and warmth. If you haven't figured it out yet, or you haven't heard this story before, the light represents mindfulness, awareness, and the warmth re represents the kindness. You do need those two qualities, the kindfulness, to open up the lotus. I already mentioned you are the lotus. And that's actually what happens. The deeper you go into that lotus, the more fragrant, the more beautiful the colors, the more profound are those layers of petals as you go closer to the jewel in the heart of that lotus. But of course, in practice what this means is you can start meditating. You sit down, you may have many instructions. The most important is the, the kindfulness, the warmth and the light of the sun. You are that sun looking at your, first of all, your body. It's obvious to me that when you first start meditating, you know, you want to make sure you're comfortable, you're aware of your body. You're hot, you're cold, you've got your aches and pains, your age-generated uh, problems or whatever else. The body must be the first. How can you get inside your body, metaphorically, to the mind which is inside? Even yesterday when I asked you, where is your mind? Using that little trick, are you happy, are you sad? then please point to that happiness for me. It's impossible to actually locate it anywhere in your body or anywhere in space. If you're really angry, really angry, point to the anger for me, it's everywhere. If you're in love, point to that love for me, it's everywhere. It's not located in one particular part of the body. It's just, it's in the mind. The mind is a different dimension altogether, totally different. You can ask me questions about that later if you wish. That's one of the reasons why, okay, I'm going off tangents again, why sometimes that when a person passes away, they can pass away in UK and they can suddenly appear in Perth. They just died. And no one can fly that fast. But these are real experiences. It's the nature of the mind is a totally different dimension. So anyhow, uh, when we have that kindness and warmth, 
to our um, ourselves, or what we take to be ourselves, first of all, the body opens up. For the body to open up and disappear, and for you to go inside, you have to be relaxed as best you possibly can. If you are sick, at least that sickness is a kind of subdued. It's like kind of benign. Otherwise, it will keep on disturbing you when you're meditating. Try and get as healthy as you possibly can. You don't have to be without any pain or discomfort. Just that pain or discomfort is pretty even. It becomes like ambient. Then it can disappear. And I'll tell you some of these other stories which I love telling, even though it's very difficult being Ajahn Brahm because you've all heard me on YouTube and everywhere else. And I even does. Uh, workers in backhoes in Sheffield have heard all these stories before. So it's very rare that you hear something new. The only thing I uh, depend upon is you all being old, having a little bit of dementia, <laughs> and thereby I can tell the story and it's like it's new to you. <laughs> and that's true, most people actually come to my talks are <coughs> a bit old. <laughs> but anyhow, just uh, for your that story when I was in a Zen monastery once. They have a, I don't know if it's still here, there was a Zen monastery in Throssel Hall in Northumberland. Is that still here? Yeah, okay. You know, in those days, this was in 1969 and 70, there were so f really few Buddhist temples anywhere. I had no choice, I'd go to anywhere which said it was Buddhist. And so they were having a retreat on, a weekend retreat, and actually, you know, that was a big sacrifice, uh, Venerable Chanda. The same weekend, in the place where I was living, the Rolling Stones were performing. I had a choice between looking at the stones or looking at my mind. I think I made the right choice. <laughs> Looked at my mind. But anyhow, I don't know if you've ever been to one of those Zen retreats. I've never been to a Zen retreat before. We were all sitting on this very narrow um, little hall it was an old barn which had been whitewashed and we had to face the wall with our eyes open. And as we were facing the wall with our eyes open, meditating, then the teacher came down the road between us, the central aisle, with a big Zen stick. It was supposed to not hurt. It was supposed to just to wake you up if you were nodding. It did wake me up. But I didn't need to be hit. The fellow sitting next to me was hit. And I was wide awake for the rest of the retreat. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like it must really hurt. But I was afraid. That's not a good way to teach people, just through fear. But anyway, the interesting part of that retreat, I had done some meditation before, but meditating with my eyes open, I'd never done that before. And what you were looking at was just a whitewashed wall. Nothing interesting at all. Not looking through a window, not looking at some, some writing or some painting, just a whitewashed wall. And then what happened, I'm not exaggerating, I was watching that, my mind was peaceful. At least I knew how to you know, keep my mindfulness in the present moment and not too much thinking. That was when the wall vanished. You had your eyes wide open, and one minute there was a wall there, and the next minute there was nothing. And that was really weird. Now that was in the 60s and 70s. Honestly, I never did drugs, but a lot of my friends did. And I thought, right, that's really cool. Walls, whole big walls vanishing. And so, at least what I used was insight. How come you, with your eyes open, one minute there's a wall there, next minute it's totally gone? And the answer was, that when you are still, things vanish. If you're just looking at a wall and nothing moves, <coughs> the image of the wall goes, it vanishes. If you have a sound, like the, there's no air con here, or there's traffic in the background, if that ambient sound doesn't increase or decrease suddenly, you don't hear anything anymore. Even right now, you're sitting on the chair, you've got pressure on your bottom. Can you feel that pressure on your bum? As you're feeling it, you notice it now. In a few moments, you won't notice it anymore. It doesn't change, it kind of disappears. 
what if what is constant vanishes. So that is the first job in meditation, especially with our physical body, to make sure if there's any aches or pains there, any disturbances, it's kind of even, it doesn't go up, doesn't go down, and then there's a good chance it disappears and vanishes. The brain is wired that way. I need to notice things which change. And that's what I learned from that. I now know that every time I close my eyes, the first thing I see is inside of my eyelids. I actually see that, but you got so used to that, you probably don't even notice that. And after a second or two, that turns off and the whole sense of sight disappears. With sound, as long as you're, you don't have to be perfectly quiet, as long as there's no increase in the sound or decrease in it, as long as it's a background noise which nothing uh, is disturbing, it disappears. This is how we calm the senses down. So we're aware of our body, we try and make it as even as possible no matter what we're experiencing. Make sure that there's, there's no sudden noise, there's no sudden smell. So I always say if anybody had lots of baked beans this morning, please make sure that your bottom is facing the wall. If someone is behind you, then that could be very disturbing. <laughs> you know one of the, <laughs> now you know why all the people sitting against the wall are doing so. <laughs> <laughs> you know one of the dangerous things, the scariest things I've ever done as a monk was over in Sri Lanka, when you go and give a talk somewhere, and it's a big talk, that sometimes they have a little procession beforehand. I remember doing this in Peridenia, in the university over there in Kandy. And they had this elephant in front of me and I was supposed to walk in procession to the university where I'd give a talk. Now, it's a, a, not a huge elephant, but it's big enough. I don't know if you've ever walked behind a, a, an elephant in Sri Lanka, but it's very, very scary. Not so much it would turn around and swipe you with its trunk but if it did pass wind. It's a huge animal. If it passed wind, I pass out. <laughs> it's true, imagine. So you have to be very careful, any you Sinhalese, if you ask me to go behind the elephant, make sure <laughs> there's a well-behaved elephant. Anyway, back to being serious. I can't be serious. There's that condensed milk this morning, I'm not serious. <laughs> so anyway, after a while you're sitting here and everything's relaxing. After a while your body does kind of disappear. You can't feel the hands, you can't feel the feet, you can't feel your back resting against the backrest or whatever. Now I say this because this is what is supposed to happen. Years and years ago, when I was teaching in Singapore, one of the Singaporeans came to complain. He said, what are you teaching? I was meditating there and I couldn't feel my hands. What's wrong with that? It was just because it was weird. They never actually experienced that before. Just the feeling in the hands disappeared. That's why I teach like this, so you know what to expect. If it starts to disappear, well done. You can't feel your hand, it's one less thing to be concerned about. If you can't feel your feet, you can't feel your legs, you can't feel your tummy, what a wonderful thing that would be, zap. <laughs> it's like it disappears and so it's not bothering you. And you can't feel your, your head or anything. The whole body vanishes. And that's not hard to do. And it happens very often, you're sitting here, you're just not aware of these things. They're not disturbing you. That frees your mind from a lot of business. The lotus has opened up. And inside, some of the next things you see, I like to say the next layer of petals becomes present moment awareness. You're going inside time. Time is opening up for you. The past and the future 
of open up and you go into the middle of time. It's like time disappears. You're just right here, right now. And I've mentioned to you, and you've heard this so many times before, in the present moment, it's so f much more freedom. Many of you had a lot of difficulties in your past. Many of you have lots of fears for your future. How do we let go of the past and future to be able to stay in this present moment, to go inside enough? And the answer is kindness. If you're kind to the past, what do I mean by being kind to the past? It means being more forgiving of anybody who hurt you or anything which you've done to hurt others. Be kind, be forgiving. You're not perfect, other people are not perfect. We live in a world where we don't expect perfection from others. We expect the opportunity to learn. We can make mistakes and grow from those mistakes rather than be bound by those mistakes from the past. It's the kindness, the wisdom that frees us from the past. It's a beautiful thing to know that in the past, whatever happened to you, no matter what you did or other people did for you, it's a wonderful place to find meaning. Meaning is a very difficult word. Yes, it hurts, but why? Why did other people do that? Why did you react that way? And when we can find meaning, the meaning is very simple to understand. It's the old truckload of dung simile. Beautiful simile. If you want to know where this actually came from, for one year I spent in this, mostly in this cave in the north, north of Thailand, in the mountains. You know how much I like tea. I found this monastery, abandoned monastery in uh, Chiang Mai in Medang district, way up in the mountains. There's no one staying in there, it was an abandoned monastery. So I had the whole place to myself, it was well supported. And the most amazing thing about this monastery, it was in the middle of a tea plantation. I had in as much tea as I ever could drink. And even there for the first time, they gave me this kombucha. They never actually showed me what it was because it was looked disgusting in this bottle where there was tea and this big fungus in it. <laughs> Have you ever had com kombucha? It's supposed to be very good for you. It didn't do me any harm. It was very delicious, but I didn't like looking at it. And so, because that was made of the, from the local tea. And so I had as much of that as I ever wanted. It was a beautiful monastery. But in that cave, there were many bats. So many bats. But then I went in there during the day and they were quiet during the day. They'd only make a noise in the early morning when they, they left to go and find something to eat and came back in the evening. But... First of all, from that experience to this day, I'm not exaggerating, one of my favorite fragrances is batshit. If I smell bat poo, it's lovely. <laughs> and Honestly, the reason is because it brings back all these wonderful associations of nice meditation in this cave. But more than that, in the front of this cave, there was a single papaya tree. And that papaya tree got all the fertilizer in the morning, all the fertilizer in the evening from the bats. That's where they would poo before they went in the cave when they went out. And that was honestly the sweetest papaya I've ever eaten in my life. It was so sweet. I'm not usually someone who likes fruit, but that fruit, wow, that was amazing. So much so that every time I saw a, uh, one of the fruits ripen, as a monk, you can't ask a person, can you pick that fruit for me? All I do is I take one of the lay people and say, look at that delicious fruit up there. <laughs> it's good you know how to look after a nun. So she won't be able to ask you, please give me this, please give me that. <coughs> Just how, what is it you really like? Like oats. Look at that delicious bag of oats over there. 
What that means is she wants some. <laughs> but that papaya was so sweet. And it's from that story we developed, you know, that simile of the truckload of dung or treading in the dog shit. What do you do when you tread in the dog shit? You've heard me say this so many times before. Never scrape it off your shoes. Never yet. Wait till you get home and you scrape it off under your apple tree or mango tree or whatever else you've got in your garden. And then your fruit will be more delicious than anybody else's. And you can imagine biting into that papaya fertilized by the bat, bat poo. Always remember, because you have to be mindful as a monk, always remember that what you're really eating is batshit. Transformed into the sweetest, juiciest, delicious papaya. And that's what happens. Anything which happened to you in your life, sometimes disgusting, terrible things, it has meaning. It's an invitation, an opportunity for you to transform that into something beautiful and compassionate and joyful. You learn and grow from this and become more wise and kind than anybody you'd ever known. So that's what actually happens once you understand what the past is there for. It's not to torture you or keep punishing yourself or trying to s seek revenge from others. Instead, it's for you to grow in kindness and compassion. And that can be done, and it gives your past meaning, allows you to let it go. And as for the future. Someone once came to see Ajahn Chah while I was there and asked him, look, you're a very wise monk. Can you read the lines on the palm of my hand? and tell him my future. And Ajahn Chah says straight away, monks don't do that. He said, I know you don't do that, but you can do that, I'm sure. And look, I've really supported your monastery, brought you food, taken you around when you need transport somewhere, help build cooties and stuff. I've been helping you all my life. I ask you a simple thing, which I know you can do. Come on, show some gratitude. You tell us to be grateful. I'm now telling you, please be grateful and read my lines on my hand. And Ajahn Chah did that. The only time he's ever told someone's future, he looked at his hand and he traced the lines with his finger really slowly. <coughs> now imagine they had lots of faith in this Ajahn Chah. He's a very amazing monk. And he's the only person to ever do this to him. Read the lines. And so every now and again, he would stop and say, uh oh. <laughs> and then he would continue going, mm. <laughs> In English, we say he was winding him up. <laughs> winding him up something terrible. And when he finished, the poor man said, Yes, yeah, what's my future going to be? He said, Ajahn Chah replied, look, I've read the lines and I won't lie to you. He said, I know you won't lie. I know you can tell the truth. Please, what's my future going to be? And Ajahn Chah said, your future, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your future, sir, is uncertain. <laughs> and Ajahn Chah wasn't wrong. <laughs> and he went... He's the only person who ever asked for his hand, his future to be read. And he was totally right. That's why, why worry about a future which is totally uncertain? You don't know what's going to happen. All you do know is if you make some good karma, you do good, you're kind, you relax, you let go, you're peaceful. That's the best you can possibly do for your future. You can't do better than that. Even at, as a monk, in my particular stage of life, I go traveling so much. And many people over in Perth say, please don't go overseas so much. Because, you know, sometimes these aircraft, they get hit even by accident, you know, by uh, missiles over uh, Ukraine or wherever it was. And they say, look, 
No, we care about you, please. We want you to live a long life. Please don't go in aircraft. And that's when I say, be positive, come on. If you die in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet, there's three benefits, three advantages. <laughs> you all know the three advantages of dying in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet? Number one, instant funeral. <laughs> How long does it take in Sheffield if you know, one of your dear relations passes away? How long do you have to wait in line to do the funeral service. And moreover, how much does it cost? It's really, really expensive. But if you have a funeral at 30,000 feet because the aircraft blows up, then it costs you nothing. More than that, you always wonder what to do with the ashes afterwards. <laughs> at 30,000 feet, they are spread over a nice wide area, just like you would like. And benefit number two, it's, all, it's troublesome, number one. Number two, it's expensive. But if you do die at 30,000 feet, your family makes money out of it. They get insurance payout. Some families, they, they, they struggle these days uh, to pay the bills. But the best of all is if you die at 30,000 feet, it's such a short way from there to go to heaven. It's very easy to make that last <laughs> leap. So those are the, of course, I'm totally making this up, but nevertheless, don't quote me on this, but it's just learning how to be positive no matter whatever happens to you in life. Find, find a meaning in it, something positive. There's always something positive there, always. And so that means we can be kind to the future and kind to the past. When you're kind to the future and the past, it's easy to let it go. Much easier to let it go. You can be in this moment. You deserve to be free. You just deserve to be here and not be burdened by the fear of what's going to happen next or the, the memories of what happened in the past. Be free from that. You can. There is a way, please take it. So when you're in this present moment, that's almost like being in the center of time. Where the petals of time have opened up and you're in this beautiful layer of petals called now. And as you go with just uh, awareness and kindness on this present moment, that starts to open up. And you get in, into another layer of petals, which is called uh, the silence of the mind. You know, a lot of the time we talk about not giving things names. So the mind is being perfectly still. It's, having been an academic before, I always noticed that one of my great hobbies was astronomy. And I remember going to one of these big observatories to the north of Cambridge, because you could do. In that uh, observatory, they had actually discovered Pluto, where the first sighting of Pluto was made. And since that time, you know, the power of that uh, telescope, you can buy a telescope in a shop, which is more powerful these days. But nevertheless, there was something magical about sitting in the seat and a huge, uh, what do you call it, telescope in front of you and you can press a button and move around this way, move the telescope up, and just uh, even looking at the moon in amplification, or looking at Saturn. Saturn was up, the rings were very visible, and you were seeing it like live, not in a photograph, but as it was happening. There's something really inspiring about that. But every time I looked at stars in the sky, I knew their names, and because I knew their names, I could not really see their beauty. I hope you understand what I mean. But the names were just like some superficial description, and I miss so much of seeing the amazing fact that these stars existed and you can see them. 
It took me many years to forget their names. And now, in the, living in a place like Australia, on a clear night, you can see the whole Milky Way. And it's absolutely breathtaking. We have these little stupas in our meditation center. And if it's like been a warm day, you can lie on your back on those stupas. The, the stone has absorbed all the heat and it keeps you nice and warm at night. You just look up at the stars and they're absolutely gorgeous. I don't know which one's which, but nevertheless, they're beautiful. You see so much more beauty with silence. So as you go deeper in to your lotus, when you go into the silence, you don't have to give things names anymore. You don't have to work out their connections. You appreciate their beauty as it is. And it's far more beautiful. The usual simile which I give, I've said it many times, but it's important that I keep repeating this because it brainwashes it into you more and more. The Lao Tzu, we go on a walk, the great Chinese Taoist master, we go on a walk with one disciple every evening and had a golden rule, you must not talk on a walk with a master. And then this new guy was chosen to be his attendant that day. Went on a walk with the master, they came to a ridge in the mountains at sunset. And it was an amazing sunset to be seen. And the young man forgot the rule and blurted out, wow, what a beautiful sunset. And at that, Lao Tzu turned around and walked back to the monastery. And when he got back to the temple, he told everybody, that young man is banned from going on a walk with me for the rest of his life. When people say, that's a bit fierce, a bit severe punishment. Anyway, what's wrong? What's wrong with saying what a beautiful sunset? And that's when Lao Tzu replied, the whole meaning of this episode. When my disciples said, what a beautiful sunset, he was not watching the sunset anymore. He was watching the words. I don't know about you, when I first heard that, I thought, wow. That is the reason why silence is much closer to the truth than any words can describe. I don't know if there are any poets in here. As a young man, I love poetry. But even the best poetry, they could come close to describing some of the most beautiful emotions I'd experienced. They could not actually get really into it, deeply into it. There were the words, and there weren't enough words. The vocabulary was not strong enough, enough to actually describe what you felt. What you felt when you were, someone close to you had died. What grief is like, what loneliness feels like what deep pain, disappointment feels like. Sometimes they can get close, but they're never really right in there. Silence can experience things much more truthfully. That's why that becomes a layer in the petals, which opens up and you get to the silence. And once you have silence, you see much more accurately than once you have silence in the mind, as that opens up, what do you think comes next in the mind after silence? You'd be surprised, but what comes after silence? Your breathing. You become aware of your breath. It's just there. You don't go looking for your breath. You don't go choosing to have your breath. Everything else has disappeared. And the breath is the only thing which is moving. Sometimes people see their heartbeat. That is just dis disturbing. Because you calm down your heartbeat till your heartbeat stops, then you're in big trouble. But your breath, you just notice the breath. 
Nothing else is moving. You don't give it names. You don't try and describe it. Just know it. And soon that becomes like even. I believe that Venerable Chanda was talking about that yesterday from the suttas. In breath and out breath, they become almost the same. There was a simile which I very meant a lot to me from the Visuddhimagga of sawing a piece of wood. If any of you have ever done any woodwork, carpentry or cabinet making, when you start sawing, you can see the end of the saw, the handle of the saw and the whole length of wood. When you focus in, like you zoom in, all you can see is three or four saw blade, saw teeth. You don't know whether those saw teeth are at the beginning of the saw blade or the end of the saw blade. You just see three or four teeth and a tiny piece of the wood you're cutting. Just where the saw is hitting the wood. That's all you see. And after a while it looks the same. Any part of the, the cut of the saw. That's what it's like with the breath. You just see this moment of breath rather than a whole <sighs> in breath. Just a tiny bit of breath. And by that time you're usually very calm and peaceful. You don't need much breath. And the feeling of the breath becomes quite sort of the same every moment. When it becomes the same every moment, similar every moment, nice and smooth, that's when it has a chance to disappear. Your breath vanishes. And I say this because many people, when they get to this stage of breath meditation, they think they've done something wrong. Their breath has vanished. I'm supposed to be with the breath. No, you are not. The breath is a vehicle you use for a certain part of the journey. When it's done its job, just let it disappear. Well, what are you left with next? As long as when you're meditating, you can experience some of the peace and joy of the meditation. It's like the breath is there. Before it vanishes, it usually becomes like this delightful breath. It's like as you deep, 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 go deeper into your lotus, the fragrance and the colours of the petals get more and more beautiful. By this time, those breaths should be incredibly delightful. So delightful that you don't really want to to go anywhere else. You're quite happy just watching your breathing. You don't do it. You don't force yourself. At this point you don't need any gatekeeper. Gatekeeper's done its job. You're enjoying it enough so the mindfulness doesn't go anywhere. It's fun. The delightful breath, the beautiful breath. That monk Ajahn Ganha, when he first started teaching, that's all he would ever teach how to do meditation. Breathe in, sabai. Breathe out, sabai. What does sabai mean? It means beautiful, delightful, delectable. Just breathe in the most delightful breath you've ever breathed in in your life. And then breathe out the most beautiful, gorgeous breath you've ever breathed out. That's what he ever taught. Absolutely brilliant. To develop that delightful feeling of the breath. And this is how you develop it. And you're breathing in and breathing out, don't want to go anywhere else. That delight is what this says in the suttas is a, a jitta sankara. It comes from the mind. It's how the mind watches the breathing. By this time, your petals are incredibly beautiful. Just watching this beautiful breath, and when the breath disappears, the beauty remains. The breath vanishes. How many of you have read Alice in Wonderland? How many of you remember the simile of the Cheshire Cat? When Alice was seeing this Cheshire Cat disappear and then appear again very quickly, so it's very, very confusing seeing a cat come and go so quickly. So the cat, out of compassion, said, OK, I'll just vanish slowly for you. <laughs> so the cat vanished slowly. And I think it was just its head. And so first of all, the ears disappeared, then the whiskers disappeared, then the cheeks disappeared. 
then oh, the chin disappeared, leaving only these smiling lips. Then the lips disappeared, leaving only the smile. And that's when Alice said, things get curiouser and curiouser. I've often seen a cat without a smile. This is the first time I've seen a smile without a cat. Absolutely beautiful. That's what happens in your meditation. You start to see the joy without the breath. Just your object of meditation, deep in those petals, is just joy and beauty. I guess. Okay. In the yes, we will. That's this afternoon, isn't it? Yes. Maybe we should do some meditation. What do you reckon? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we'll do a commercial break and do some meditation. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll go back to the chitta this afternoon. What happens after the breath has vanished, your body is gone? And all you've got left is the bliss. In, stretch. Yes, yeah, so please stretch your mind. <laughs> Have a physical stretch if you wish. Yeah, I'll we'll get into it. Yeah. Thank you. She, that, she said that was terrible. <laughs> no, it says wonderful. Yeah. I'll get deep into it in a moment. Mm. Sorry. Stretch, yeah, I'm stretching. I'm very happy. My body feels good. Yes, this is what's coming next. <laughs> this is what you become aware of. Do we finish at 5 to 11 or 11? Well, half past 12. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, I know nothing. That was my management guru, the one who inspired me on how to lead. And that was Sergeant Schultz, Hogan's Heroes on TV when I was young. Does anybody remember Hogan's Heroes? Sergeant Schultz, he was playing a, a guard at a German POW camp during the war, and he would always put his hands over his eyes and say, I see nothing, I see nothing. <laughs> when all, all the, I think it's American POW camp, they were all messing around, plotting the overthrow of the, of the, the government. I kind of like that as a, as a manager. Mm. I see nothing, I see nothing. <laughs> Did none of you see that when you were kids? Most people are not British. I must be really old. None of you... It's an international group. Yeah, but that's an international... It's not, okay. What happened to the Brits? They don't come to meditation. <laughs> I, anyway, it's good management technique. Shall I teach you that? To, so, uh, <laughs> Anu Kampa Bikuni project can thrive. I see nothing, I hear nothing, <laughs> I know nothing. Okay, I'll behave now. <laughs> <laughs> so, a nice little guided meditation for half an hour, 25? Half an hour, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 
Thank you. No, I can't say it's thankless. <laughs> so, you close your eyes. So imagine that you are a lotus flower. Just imagine that. And you're closed up. And what you're aware of may not seem promising. Sometimes you, it's hard to believe that deep inside of this is this beautiful jewel in the heart of the lotus. Bliss, deep jhanas, enlightenment. To imagine that could exist inside of you is, is you think unlikely. Many of you may think that enlightenment can't happen for you. But literally, it is inside each one of you. All you need to do is learn how to patiently open up those petals. So first of all, with the petal which is your body, How does your body feel? Be simply aware of your body and add kindness. With kindfulness, your body can relax. And if there's any part of your body which is tense, hurting, See if you can go inside of it. To get through things, we go into them first. And soon you get to that spot where everything on the outside seems far from you. Feelings which were once central to you become distant. Eventually, once the body tends to disappear, right in the very center, you may be aware of what we call the layer of petals called time. All the past and the future which you have to deal with. Some of the past might be hard to let go of. Please give it immense kindness. Give yourself kindness. It makes it easier to let it go. In the future, give yourself kindness. <coughs> kindness is close to confidence. Like someone saying, and you believe it, you can do it. And you can. And once you've been kind to the past and kind to the future, it's easier to stay in this present moment, which is far more beautiful. And you learn much more from the present than you can ever learn from the past. And now, right now, is a place where, the, where your future is being made. If you care about your future,
care about this present moment. Be aware of it and be kind. So in this present, I kind of make sure that it's not infected by the past, no matter what happened. And I always remember that little statement I said, if I can make this moment peaceful and free, that's the best I can ever do for my future. So I come into this present moment. I really come into it. And I can feel just how beautiful, how beneficial, how safe is this present moment. I've gone into an amazing layer of petals. Beautiful, refreshing, energizing. Present moment. I don't do this through force. This present moment attracts me. It comes like a home. In this present moment, after a while, another layer of petals opens up. That's all the words, the discriminating wisdom. Names which separate things. They all vanish. This beautiful silence. Because silence, you can perceive it as beautiful, so beneficial. It's seeing the beauty and the purpose in silence. It's the cause for you being able to rest in silence. You don't have to go anywhere else. Just be silent. You don't have to give anything a name. You know how it feels. And knowing those feelings is far more descriptive than any word can describe. If you stay in silence long enough, the silence opens up. And you'll be amazed how what you become aware of is the feeling of your breath. You don't choose your breath. The breath chooses you. It's just a natural experience of a mind becoming more and more free. In this moment, silent, and the breath just happens. But as you are observing the breath, please see if you can observe the delight of the breath when you're not making it happen, you're passively observing it happening. It feels so much more beautiful. You realize you've got nothing to do in the whole world. Just to watch one breath in one moment. For those of you who work too hard, me included, it's a beautiful place of relaxation. It's watching one breath at a time, one part of a breath at a time. 
And it's delightful. Your mind appreciates it. And soon that delight grows. If you try and give these things names, it destroys the joy. No need to be a philosopher. It's like being an aesthete, knowing the joys of the mind.
getting close to the end of the meditation now. How do you feel? How deep into the lotus flower did your mind go? Always with mindfulness and kindness, just those two. Now please open your eyes to end this meditation. Beautiful. Okay, yes. So for those of you who want to do the walking meditation, same as yesterday. I'm going to do walking meditation too. Walking to lunch. And the lunch is 11.30, I believe. Bon appétit. <laughs>